Hey, good day, everybody, and welcome to your Ruby Live event. My name is Eric Weinkoop, and I'm the Director of Culinary Instruction here at Ruby, and I'm also one of your chef instructors in your courses. And I want to specifically welcome you to my office hours today. This is your chance uh, to ask me questions about food and cooking, and I'll do my best to respond to those. All right. And uh, let me cover just a couple of housekeeping items before we jump into today's program. Uh, you know, first of all, if you take a look at the right hand side of your screen uh, in the upper right hand area, you're going to see a dialogue box. It says add question here. And if you would like to participate a little bit more directly in today's conversation, uh, either with a question or a comment, you know, feel free to enter that there and it'll make its way to the queue that you see on the right-hand side of the page. Uh, and then the second thing I wanna mention is, if you look at the individual questions that are already posted, you'll notice a heart-shaped icon uh, in the upper right-hand corner. And if you would like that question addressed sooner than later, go ahead and click on that heart, and it'll push that question up in priority, okay? Um, but otherwise, you know, I'm uh, pretty sure I'm going to get to all these questions today. All right. And um, so, you know, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into today's program. And what I'd like to do is start with a topic of my own. And this is based on a number of questions that I've received just in the last uh, probably seven to 10 days. And those questions have uh, concerned the heating of your pan and you know specifically you know what we call the water test or the mercury ball test and you'll see this in a few of our courses and um, you know basically that uh, is a technique to help guide you through the process of heating your pan before you place food into it to start cooking okay so i'd like to talk a little bit more broadly about that context and then more specifically about the, the water test or the so-called mercury ball test, okay? Uh, first, you know, the idea of heating your pan before you put food in it is really important. And that's why we have a separate uh, or a standalone lesson that addresses this topic. And there are at least a couple of reasons that come to mind, you know, as to why that's important. And the first one is usually when we put food into a pan, we want to develop browning, you know, through caramelization and the Maillard uh, process. And uh, that browning is going to contribute to flavor. It's, it's part of the flavor development of your dish, uh, as well as the visual interest um, when it comes to the presentation of your finished product. Okay, so a hot pan, um, you know, before, uh, you know, you, you add your food is going to be very important to achieve those results. And then another aspect that comes to mind is that for some items, especially uh, for those that are cooking meats, uh, a hot pan is going to minimize sticking to the pan. And uh, so therefore, it's important to bring that temperature up to a pretty good uh, level uh, and then we add the food product and then just let it sit there and let the pan and the heat do its work. And uh, after a couple of minutes or sometimes a few short minutes, the food item will start to release by itself. And I mean, otherwise, if we start to tug at it too soon, we experience tearing of the food. Okay. And so those are a couple of primary reasons why we want to heat the pan um, you know, before uh, we add the food product. And then a related phenomenon that takes place is that, you know, when you add food product to a pan, um, we, the, the pan is going to cool down, right, due to the, uh, the, the relatively cool temperature of the food item. So uh, first of all, heat the pan. But then once we heat the pan, it's also important not to add 
too much food product to the pan at one time because the temperature of the pan will drop significantly and that browning process will stop. Uh, and the, the result is that the food item begins to steam in the pan. And uh, often juices, you know, the, the liquids from within the food will be drawn out. And then the item, you know, might even end up, uh, you know, simmering or um, sort of lightly boiling uh, as the food item loses moisture. And it isn't uh, until all that moisture evaporates that the browning process will resume again. And then, as you can probably imagine, the result is going to be a product that's drier than it needs to be because it's lost so much moisture during those few minutes in the pan. Okay. And uh, so the, uh, the process of heating the pan really is important. Hence, we have this lesson uh, that focuses on um, this mercury ball test. Uh, okay. So now let's talk about the test. And um, so very basically, uh, the, the lesson itself focuses on a stainless steel pan. And we ask you to add a small amount of liquid as you slowly heat the pan up. And then uh, watch what the water does. Watch the way it acts and reacts in the pan. And, you know, initially it just sort of hits the pan and splatters, you know, as you can imagine a drop of rain would do as it, as it uh, hits a surface. Uh, but as the water heats up, um, those little splashes form little droplets that maintain their spherical shape on the surface of the pan. Uh, and then as the pan continues to heat up, those small droplets tend to coalesce into one large droplet. You might see a couple of three stray droplets around, um, but you'll see uh, basically a large drop of water form in the pan. And it's at that point or in that temperature range that we generally consider it ideal to add your food to the pan. Okay, excuse me just a second. Now, if you go past this point, of uh, basically forming that single drop, the drop tends to break apart again into smaller droplets. And so you want to be aware of that as you're testing through this temperature range, right, as your pan heats up, okay? Now, I want to mention a couple of safety items here, all right? Uh, when we're heating the pan to a high temperature, uh, generally speaking, it's important to use a, uh, an oil that has a high smoke point and a correspondingly high flash point. So the smoke point of an oil is the temperature at which it starts to burn and it's going to give off smoke. And when you're right at that smoke point, uh, the, the amount of smoke is going to be relatively small. But the more the pan temperature is above the smoke point of the oil, the more smoke uh, is going to be produced. Okay. And uh, then the next benchmark we get to is called the flash point. The flash point of an oil is the temperature at which it will burst into fire. And uh, so if your pan temperature is at or beyond the flash point of the oil that you're using, as soon as you add the oil to the pan, you're going to get a big flame uh, that pops up out of your pan. So please be aware of that and, um, you know, exercise some caution. And um, so, you know, first of all, uh, you know, if you let me, let me give you two scenarios in terms of, of um, when we would use this so-called mercury ball test. One would be in no oil cooking, right? Uh, so in which case we don't have to worry about the smoke point or the flash point of oil, thank goodness. Um, all we need to, to focus on is uh, perhaps immediate burning of the food in case the pan is too hot, all right? And so this is just part of the learning curve. So and, and, you know, we need to conduct these tests 
um, as we heat up the pan in order for you to understand your pan, in order to understand the heat, and then also to understand the food that you put in the pan. So in the case of no oil cooking, um, you know, as you're heating the pan up and, and when you think you're right about in that temperature range that's going to be ideal, then go ahead and add some of your food product uh, and then just pay attention to it. And if you notice that it uh, sticks and burns immediately, then you know the pan is too hot. And very simply, we start uh, uh, to adjust the temperature down right before we add the food again. And um, if the food does stick and start to, to uh, brown too fast or even burn, we add a little bit of water. Um, it, it could be a flavorful liquid like a stock. That, that's fine. Uh, you know, so long as the stock doesn't have much particulate in suspension because those little bits would burn as well. Whereas in this uh, you know, early stage of, of the cooking, if you just add some water, um, that's probably your safest bet uh, to start with, okay? And that's going to cool the pan temperature. It's gonna loosen the food item from the surface of the pan and allow you to move the food item around, you know, to, um, to turn it over, for example, so that other uh, facets or other, other uh, edges are making contact and, uh, you know, therefore avoid burning and then also even out the browning process. Okay. And so um, uh, as we proceed then uh, through this process with, again, with no oil sauteing, as you develop the color that you want, then uh, go ahead and deglaze for the final time with your flavorful liquid and then proceed with the rest of your cooking. Okay, now let's shift gears to, let's call it conventional cooking, which does use oil in the saute process, all right? So if you're heating your pan, please exercise caution, right? So, um, uh, you know, we're, we're aware of and, and can, can, you know, be careful around the smoke point and especially the flash point. Add oil just a small bit at a time to see what happens, okay? And, uh, you know, if the um, uh, oil bursts into flames, then you got to put a lid on it to uh, put out the fire. Uh, if it's smoking, and you know, you're past the smoke point of the oil, then very simply pull the pan off of the fire and start to let that cool down, okay? Don't put your pan uh, in the sink with cold water. Don't run cold water in it um, because very often what can happen is that that cold water will shock the hot pan and will warp your pan, all right? And, and you're gonna experience permanent damage. So uh, just simply pull it off the, the fire and then adjust your fire down. Okay, and once the, the pan, um, you know, when it's sitting there, the next step in terms of cooling it down would be to add um, some, some food product to it because the food product is gonna be colder than the pan and will absorb the heat. Okay, so a two-step process there. Stop the smoke, stop the burning of the oil. Uh, and then cool the pan down uh, by adding food to it, okay? And now that's that worst case scenario, right? If, we, if we're uh, dealing with a pan that's too hot. Um, our goal, right, is to kind of play with this process of heating the pan repeatedly if we need to in order to find that safe zone where the pan is adequately hot to start to brown the food immediately upon uh, you know, placing the food in the pan um, without burning it too quickly. Um, now, uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that if, if the pan is uh, pretty hot, you add the food uh, and sometimes we need to turn the pan down, the temperature down a little bit, um, you know, as the food is also absorbing heat 
and cooling the pan down. So there's two things happening at once here, um, but ultimately to avoid burning the food. Okay. And uh, again, this is a, a repetitive process of practice uh, that's going to be necessary for you. Now, the way I'd like you to practice, okay, is to feel the heat from the pan as you're warming up the pan. So use your hands. Uh, also notice the, the radiant heat onto your arms and even onto your face. I like to, I like to place my face over the pan and kind of look down uh, in, in order to gauge uh, how the pan is heating up. And that's one way that we start to learn with this whole body experience. And we, we'll start to be able to uh, cook by feel, right? We gain a, a feel for cooking. And, you know, with just a, a few rounds of this sort of engagement, you're going to know uh, when your pan is hot enough for given food items. Keep in mind that each food item, uh, generally speaking, right, is uh, you're going to have a, a, um, uh, a slightly different sort of ideal pan temperature. Uh, some things obviously are more delicate, uh, like garlic, uh, or, or at least you're going to find that they're very quickly, that they're uh, uh, very delicate and they burn quickly. Whereas other thing li things like carrots and celery are much more hearty and they can withstand a, a higher uh, pan temperature. And uh, that's, this is just part of your learning curve. Okay. And um, the goal is for you to just use this mercury ball test a few times learn to cook by feel, you know, through your engagement in the process, and then just stop using the mercury ball test. Okay. Uh, but of course, you know, keeping in mind um, the smoke point um, of the oil that you're using. And, you know, you don't necessarily have to know the exact smoke point temperature, right, of the oil. In fact, that's not the point at all uh, of this exercise. Um, I sometimes have students ask me, um, what uh, pan temperature exactly um, should I be aiming for? I have an infrared thermometer. I want to check it. And um, I don't know. Um, the, the whole point being that uh, you shouldn't have to use any tools, but rather you can just, you know, use your own senses uh, to figure out um, what's going on in the pan and then how to proceed, okay? Um, so, you know, give this a try. Uh, there is some trial and error involved, of course, as with all cooking and we, as we develop skills, uh, we need to practice through that given skill multiple times, right? Uh, practice makes you better. And then also keep in mind that um, the, the follow-up to all of this is that you get to scrub your pans. And, uh, you know, the, with, with a hot pan, uh, you'll end up, uh, if not burning, just uh, browning um, certain little uh, sort of moist, you know, uh, I don't know what you call it, just, just some of the constituents of the food um, that will stick to the sides of the pan. And um, it'll require a good dose of elbow grease uh, to remove, okay? And, uh, you know, I like to use... Um, you know, one of these scrubbies um, that has that's green colored. It's a 3M or a Scotch Bright product, and uh, they you know they come in different coarsenesses for uh, you know, different types of stains. And I find that on stainless steel, anyway, that the green colored scrubby works really well. Now, one thing that it will do is leave little scratches on the surface of your pan, which is no big deal, okay? Stainless steel is very hardy and um, you're gonna end up with a clean pan. Um, I also receive occasionally questions or comments from students that say, I just bought this beautiful stainless steel cookware set. Um, how do I clean it without scratching it? And I don't know the answer to that, okay? Um, uh, from my perspective, if you've got uh, some scratches in your pan, you know, it shows the world that you cook and that's a, a badge of honor. And so I don't have any problems uh, to see scratches in my pan nor in yours. Uh, and so I hope you will go forth 
you know, with this exercise and, uh, you know, have, uh, have fun with that learning process. Now, the last thing I want to mention is that while that particular lesson focuses on stainless steel cookware, um, you know, be aware that um, the basic process of heating your pan is very similar with other types of pans. And any type of pan can be used in our courses. Um, really, anything that I can think of can be used. And, um, you know, whether it's an earthenware pan, glazed or unglazed, um, copper, um, you know, I use stainless steel and sometimes tin lined copper, uh, as well as cast iron lined and um, enameled and everything works fine um, but do keep in mind that the mercury ball test will not work in the same way for pans other than stainless steel okay which means that um, uh, you'll need to just rely upon the the feel right just feeling the heat um, and then also keep in mind that depending on the type of pan that you're using uh, you know, you may or may not want to heat it up as much as you would a stainless steel pan. So, for example, a non-stick pan, don't heat that up so much because it's it's uh, not a good thing generally for the surface um, um, that's been applied, that non-stick surface. And, um, you know, also uh, pans such as copper, uh, because of the conductivity of copper, those pans will heat up pretty quickly. And so usually you can work at a lower temperature um, in terms of the setting on your stovetop. Uh, when it comes to uh, cast iron, you know, usually, you know, we're going to uh, be at a, a, a pretty similar temperature, I think, uh, as we would with stainless steel. But all of that just takes some practice and you can adapt uh, any cookware that you have to, you know, these uh, procedures. Okay. So um, keep in mind that heating your pan, generally speaking, is an important step and that, uh, you know, with your practice, you'll figure out where that, um, that, that uh, ideal range is for your cookware and for specific food items. All right. Have fun with it. Thank you. All righty. Now uh, let's address your questions of the day. Let me take a, a sip first. Okay, the uh, first question is from Brandy, who says, what is the best way to clean a sill pad? They end up greasy or browned. Okay, so a uh, sill pad, for all of you out there, uh, is a brand name um, for silicone baking mats. And there are a number of different brands out there. Um, sill pad is a popular one, and hence... Um, that brand has come to identify the product itself, okay? So, uh, you know, keep in mind that these, um, you know, silicone, you know, non-stick cooking mats will uh, deteriorate over time. And part of the deterioration process is browning. Um, so on one hand, we have stains uh, that can be uh, wiped off. And on the other hand, we have a, a darkening of the surface that cannot be cleaned, okay? Um, you know, in fact, these mats have a maximum recommended temperature in terms of your oven setting. And it's often in the neighborhood of uh, 450 degrees Fahrenheit. And, um, you know, if, if you use them at that maximum temperature or beyond, uh, they will brown pretty quickly. Okay, so do keep that in mind. But otherwise, you know, in terms of cleaning a sill pat or a similar silicone mat, um, you know, the, the best luck that, uh, you know, I've had with is to uh, apply a, a detergent of your choice, you know, whatever that happens to be in the kitchen, and uh, use a uh, scrubby. And this is where I like to use a a more delicate scrubby, not that harsher green one that I referenced uh, a moment ago, but a more delicate scrubby uh, on both sides and then just rinse it uh, thoroughly. And sometimes that needs to be done two or three times, uh, depending on just what was cooked on the mat and just what type of fat uh, and how much of that fat is left behind. Okay. And, um, uh, and then, and then you're good to go. Okay. 
um, you know, at, um, you know, I, I haven't done this in any sort of a controlled uh, setting, but uh, it seems that sometimes that uh, as these masks get older, that that oiliness uh, might be more difficult to clean off. I'm not sure. Um, it could poss possibly be that the uh, that the surface of the mat is changing and, and simply starts to feel different. It's just a hypothesis. You know, I'm not sure. Um, but that's my approach to cleaning those silicone uh, baking mats. All right, give it a try. Thank you. All right. And then the next question, uh, how do you prep and use jackfruit? I see it as a produce uh, in cans and packets. I'm usually a from scratch cook when I have the time. I don't want to serve pre-processed food to my vegan son when he visits. Okay, good. Yeah, so, um, you know, jackfruit um, has been a popular food in much of the world for a really long time. Uh, I'd say in, in recent years, it's um, gained more traction here in the U.S. anyway. Um, you know, especially as plant-based cooking has uh, come uh, more uh, to uh, into the mainstream, and uh, folks have been reaching for jackfruit in particular to mimic the texture of certain meat preparations. So, in particular, shredded meat preparations like pork and chicken, and. Um, so, you know, jackfruit, uh, depending on its degree of ripeness, um, can certainly be used in uh, savory or sweet applications. The more ripe it is, you know, the more uh, sort of fruity sweetness and, and sugars are developed. And, uh, you know, we would use it for smoothies or ice cream or um, you know, just to, to eat on its own as a dessert. Whereas in its less ripe form, while it still has, you know, certain... Uh, distinctive flavors are not quite as pronounced and the sweetness isn't uh, developed uh, so much. Um, there might be some residual sugar, but uh, not, not a lot uh, compared to its uh, ripe state. And so in its less ripe state is when we use it in savory applications, uh, again, primarily to mimic the texture of certain meat preparations. So, you know, in terms of prepping it, um, you know, when we go to the store, see, um, the jackfruit can be quite large and, you know, very often we don't need a whole jackfruit. So when you go to the store, you might find just a portion of a jackfruit, a quarter or um, an eighth of a jackfruit, for example. And, um, you know, when we get that home, we want to um, sort of uh, open that up. If it's a whole one, just slice it right down the middle. Uh, in order to expose all the flesh on the inside. And basically what we're trying to uh, use are those little nodules or, or packets that you'll see um, throughout the fruit. And within each one of those is a big pit. And um, so the, uh, the, the rest of that uh, fiber around the edges um, often isn't used. Um, and, and there's, um, you know, we'll end up uh, capturing most of the fruit once we pull all those little, uh, little packets of goodness out. All right. And um, so, uh, you know, those then uh, can be consumed raw uh, if you wish, and or you can apply any cooking method you want to them. OK, uh, you know, if you're trying to mimic a shredded pork, you know, sort of a texture, then at some point we want to uh, finish it up with a dry heat method in order to evaporate the moisture, tighten up the texture and bring out more of the, the stringy fiber, uh, which mimics that uh, stringiness of a shredded meat, okay? And, um, you know, we often will start with a moist heat cooking method, whether it's uh, braising or steaming in order to soften up the, uh, the fruit uh, before applying dry heat to finish. Uh, the seeds, you know, which are pretty good size, those can be eaten as well. And uh, very often they're uh, simmered, right, or boiled uh, in order to, to cook them all the way through. And, you know, they can be eaten kind of like a, like a small potato or a, or a big nut, you know, something like that. There's going to be a, a pretty tough skin uh, that needs to be peeled. And then you can enjoy, 
you know, the inside of that seed. Um, so, you know, jackfruits are very versatile and um, uh, generally easy to handle. You know, the one thing that makes them a bit of a challenge is that they're very, very sticky inside. And so a recommendation is to apply oil to your knife as you are slicing it open or breaking down those large pieces into more manageable pieces. Okay. And, um, you know, there I've seen, you know, some folks like oil up their whole knife, including their handle. And I would say avoid putting oil on the handle of your knife only because uh, it increases the risk of your hand sliding off the handle and bumping into the blade in some fashion and perhaps, you know, cutting yourself. So oil the knife, break down the jackfruit, re-oil the blade as you need to, okay? And then otherwise, once it's open, you know, you might um, apply some oil to your hands, right, as well, uh, as you go in uh, to uh, break down that inner flesh, okay, of the jackfruit, all right? Um, but again, it's a super versatile fruit, could be cooked, eaten raw, any cooking method really could be applied to it. You can in, um, incorporate that into preparations that are suitable for any meal period of the day. And um, of course, it's not restricted to, you know, vegan cooking per se, right? But uh, anybody can enjoy it. And uh, so have some fun with it. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next question, right, is from Linda, who writes, what are the best pots and pans to use? Is nonstick good to use or parchment paper or silicone mat? Okay, interesting. So we have um, what looks like a couple of questions here. And, um, you know, I don't think there is a best category of pots and pans. I, that's not my opinion. Um, or, or I should say that I am of the opinion that there isn't a best category of pots and pans. Um, you know, first of all, um, if you want to or need to use whatever you currently have, then please use whatever cookware you currently have. Okay. It's not a requirement that you go out and buy new pots and pans for our courses. Um, however, you might be motivated to do so, okay? And, um, you know, if a full set is within your uh, budget, then consider that. Uh, if buying one piece or two pieces, um, you know, is a better place to start, that's perfect as well, all right? Uh, you know, in terms of things to consider, uh, when you're choosing cookware, uh, you know, ease of cleaning, um, you know, maybe to some extent, um, uh, gosh, you know, none of them are particularly difficult to clean, uh, you know, with um, soaking, for example, if you have uh, some persnickety food that's kind of stuck to the surface. Um, Non-stick pans um, are certainly clean up uh, pretty easily, Okay. Uh, however, let me uh, share my thoughts on non-stick cookware before I, I proceed with the rest of my, my uh, response here. And that is, um, I don't recommend buying a full set of non-stick cookware, at least based upon my experience to date. And that's because non-stick cookware uh, with use uh, will uh, uh, acquire micro scratches on the surface such that over time food begins to stick and uh so you know you'll end up having to you know replace pans from uh from time to time and so i consider a non-stick pan to be a disposable item in my kitchen and you know i'll use a pan for as long as it lasts whether it's a couple years or or something more uh, and then I'll replace that one or, or maybe two pans, but all of the other pans in our, in our um, cookware inventory are going to be of some other material, okay? Stainless steel pans uh, are pretty hardy. You know, you can uh, bang them around and, uh, you know, there's no enamel to chip off. Um, they don't tend to dent. Um, I mean, unless you're really 
going to town on them, but uh, they're they're pretty strong. And on the inside, you can scrub on them. And um, uh, again, they tend to have a long shelf life. And in fact, they'll probably last you a lifetime if you buy a decent quality set. Okay. Um, and, you know, in terms of buying a stainless steel cookware set, uh, you know, one uh, you know, quick test that um, I, I try to, to do at the store is um, I'll look at the pan and where the handle attaches, and I'll just kind of see if I can if I can wiggle that handle uh, to see how you know thick and strong the gauge of the metal is and what that attachment point looks like. Usually they're going to be spot welded, um, but if there's much movement at all. I steer clear of it uh, because that is going to be the weak point. Um, I have experienced on a couple of occasions spot welds breaking and um, also handles that have bent. And um, so I, I recommend pans that are really sturdy, ones that, you know, if you really kind of give it a, a, a good attempt to, to, to tweak that handle, that it doesn't really give much or at all. Okay, that's a, a, an important test for me anyway. All right. Um, now, most all stainless steel cookware uh, these days uh, will have some sort of a, um, a base layer that's stuck to the pan. OK. And uh, that uh, base layer may consist of, of um, usually multiple layers of uh, aluminum uh, and copper in order to evenly conduct heat across the, the bottom surface of that stainless steel pan, because otherwise stainless steel is not such a good conductor of uh, heat. It's not uh, real even. And so that sort of a, a base layer is applied to even that out. Okay. Um, you know, otherwise, uh, you know, other cookware, you got um, uh, cast iron, uh, enameled or, or not. Uh, that works really well. It just takes some practice. Uh, to, to use it really as any cookware does. Okay. And, you know, I've got uh, friends and colleagues that um, don't want to use anything else but cast iron well, if, if possible. And I can appreciate that, you know, but uh, for other cooks, it gets very heavy. And that's something to, to think in, uh, to, to keep in mind um, when you go to the store to look at cookware, pick it up you know, with the hand that uh, you're going to be sautéing with or otherwise moving the pan around with uh, across the stovetop. And then keep in mind that once it's filled with food, it might be two, three, four, five pounds heavier than it is uh, in its empty state. Um, and so think about uh, that user friendliness, okay? Um, copper cookware looks great. It conducts heat really well. Uh, it tends to be expensive, okay? And most of what you find today, at least in uh, the U.S. market, is lined with stainless steel uh, because stainless steel is easy to clean. It's very hardy. Um, if you buy the old school tin-lined copper cookware, keep in mind that at some point it'll need to be re-tinned because the tin will wear down over time, okay? And that's, that's a process that's required really just... Uh, once every many years, uh, just depends on uh, how much cooking you do and um, uh, you know how how you handle the pans more specifically. Okay, um, and then uh, there's earthenware pots, there's stone containers, and then you know all of those work nicely as well. Uh, they just require some practice, um, uh, you know, in terms of heating and uh, the pans. Uh, in other words, not to do it too quickly. Uh, becomes very important when you're dealing with earth earthenware pans um, in order to uh, minimize temperature shock and the introduction of cracks. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, otherwise, excuse me a second. You know, stainless steel pans are probably the most popular and uh, prices really um, are found across the spectrum. You know, you can buy what I think is a pretty decent set of stainless steel cookware at Costco, you know, uh, under the uh, Kirkland brand, not their stainless, uh, not their nonstick product, but they're just plain old stainless steel, probably in the neighborhood of a couple hundred bucks. And you can probably, uh, you know, easily find other cookware, you know, where you add a zero to that number uh, and essentially get the same uh, sorts of, uh, of products. So it's really up to your budget. 
Uh, it's up to, you know, what sort of um, an, an image um, that you want to or, or need to present to um, to friends and family. And, um, uh, you know, that would uh, dictate uh, what you might buy. OK, um, but keep that in mind, you know, as you look around for cookware. Thank you. All right. Next question reads, uh, a friend of ours cooked, uh, especially for us, in a tagine. So uh, one that was suitable for an induction uh, range. Okay, interesting. Uh, I don't have such a tagine, um, but I do have a cast iron cookware pan. You know, will that give, um, you know, similar results? Uh, so interesting. Um, uh, yeah, we've got a tagine here at home and uh, in the past, you know, I've used a tagine uh, a handful of times and, um, but I haven't used one for an induction range. So this is, uh, this is new information for me. Thank you for sharing Monique. So um, let's, let's talk about this very briefly here. So uh, a tagine uh, really is just a, uh, it's a two part cookware set. There's a flat shallow ish bottom with a conical uh, shaped lid. And, uh, you know, when foods cook, those steams, uh, the, the steam condenses on the inside of that uh, lid, and then they run back down into the pan in order to continue this moisturizing process. So it maintains, um, you know, a relatively gentle, um, you know, atmosphere inside of the vessel. Um, can that be replicated with other containers? You bet it can. And I mean, fundamentally, if you have a, a, a lid, and, and they're all going to be at least slightly domed for that very same reason, reason uh, to encourage condensation to run off the sides. And, um, you know, you can achieve some similar results. I would suggest that you just give it a try and, um, you know, see how that works um, with whatever cookware that you have. And, uh, you know, see for yourself how those results, um, you know, mimic or, you know, come close to the results of uh, what you had uh, at your friend's place. All right. Thank you. Okay. Next question says, I'm at work, so unable to attend the live event. Uh, I'm looking to upgrade my knives. I'm seeing such a wide range in prices, even the same brands via different stores. Can you suggest brands and places to buy from, perhaps direct from brand like Hinkle? Um, so uh, this is a, a great question, and it's um, uh, kind of like the cookware question, right, where it's... Um, uh, there's a broad playing field out there, and, and therefore this conversation can, you know, can uh, uh, be a little bit lengthy. But, you know, let me first say that selecting, um, you know, cookware, you know, ideally would be done in person. And I understand that, especially in places like the U.S., that's more and more difficult because the old cutlery stores are few and far between, unfortunately. Um, but I feel it's important to select a knife that's comfortable. And um, if you can get your hand on the knife to, to feel how the handle, you know, fits into your hand, the shape and the size of your hand, um, and then to feel the weight and the balance of the knife um, that that's a, a desirable experience before you plunk down, um, you know, some money. And, um, you know, even if that means kind of going to a friend's house and checking out their cutlery uh, to see if, uh, you know, it might be appealing to you. Okay. Um, you know, or maybe you can find, you know, a, a um, one of these common retail stores that'll let you um, you know, at least hold the knife, if not use it to cut, you know, some onions or carrots or something just to get a feel for it. That would be very nice. All right. Um, so, you know, in terms of knives, uh, prices, first of all, range 
um, from accessible um, by most people to uh, bespoke custom made knives um, that can be, you know, a thousand dollars, you know, per item, uh, for example. All right. So uh, it, it's going to depend upon what your requirements are in terms of budget as well as image. Okay. And um, now on one hand, I will share an example. Um, and uh, this is uh, uh, a line of knives uh, by Victorinox. And Victorinox uh, is the company that makes the Swiss Army knives, for example. And they have multiple cutlery lines, but one of them, one of them is called Fibrox. And I find that the Fibrox line of knives provides a good value. Uh, and in fact, a number of years ago now, uh, the Consumer Reports magazine uh, rated their the um, Victorinox Fibrox chef's knife as their best buy. And um, it, it's um, I would consider it, um, on one hand, an entry-level knife in terms of price, um, but it's also a knife that you, know, you can just use. I mean, it really doesn't matter how much experience you have or how much money you have in your wallet. Um, you know, it's a knife that, you know, on one hand is inexpensive enough that um, if, if something happened to it, uh, it wouldn't be some fantastic loss. You could easily replace it. Um, in terms of the blade, uh, it's uh, nothing to write home about. It's a stamped steel blade, which is considered sort of low on the totem pole um, of, uh, you know, um, quality or craftsmanship. It's got a, a, a molded rubber handle. Again, nothing real exciting about that. Um, but it works. It's a workhorse. They're durable. Um, the, the metal is hard enough to um, hold its edge, its cutting edge, for a reasonably long period of time, yet it's soft enough to sharpen uh, and, and to maintain yourself if you choose to do that. And, um, you know, so with those uh, points in mind, I consider it to be a good value. Now, uh, again, it's not the most interesting, uh, uh, you know, conversation-worthy, good-looking knife to have in your kitchen. And uh, so there are many, many others to choose from that are popular. And uh, many of those are great knives. And it's really going to be up to you, again, to find a good feel, uh, a good fit, um, and then give it a try. Uh, most of these other knives uh, that, that I can think of, whether it's... Um, you know, a Shun brand or a Mac brand or something else, um, you know, they might start you out at a price point that's, you know, a, a little over a hundred bucks, let's say for a, a knife and then go up from there. And so, um, you know, that's a, of course, a personal decision um, that, that you get to weigh. Um, let uh, me also note that um, Richard just uh, listed up the Victoria Knox uh, link. So please take a look at those if you're interested. Um, and then also, you know, when it comes to maintenance of uh, knives, and, you know, in this case, uh, metal knives rather than ceramic, but metal knives, um, use a steel, um, you know, a, a honing steel, um, you know, once a day is probably enough for home cooks. And, um, uh, you know, just to keep the, the edge straightened up and as sharp as it can be. Now, over time, that, um, that cutting edge starts to, to, to wear down and uh, to the point where putting it on the, the honing rod or steel won't really do any good. And that's when you have to get them sharpened. And so when you sharpen a knife, you've got some choices, right? You can uh, do it yourself with um, one of these simple sort of uh, electric tools or sometimes even a manual sort of, you know, drag the blade through the, the two discs sort of a, a, a product, uh, which, which are, are fine. I think it's, it's certainly better than nothing, but some of them are, um, you do, a, I think, a, a decent job. Uh, you can also use whetstones uh, to maintain your own knives. Uh, keep in mind that, you know, as cool as that sounds and as trendy as YouTube uh, videos would make that out to be, there's a learning curve. And, you know, you can do uh, a lot of damage uh, to your knives um, on your whetstones 
um, you know, as you're, you're ramping up your, your skills. So I always recommend a practice knife um, before you pull out your, um, your really expensive knives to, to sharpen yourself. Uh, then the other alternative is to send the knives out to a professional knife sharpener. And here I would also uh, throw out a word of caution, and that is to, to ask around and to find somebody uh, that um, will indeed do a good job sharpening the knives. And you, um, if, you're, if you can't find a word of mouth recommendation, you might just send out a less expensive knife and see how it comes back. And I say this because um, in the past, uh, a small, thank, thank goodness, a small number of our students have shared with me um, the results of sending a knife out to a professional who really lacked professional skills. And uh, the, the, uh, the knife sharpener actually um, did about, I'm not kidding you, about 50 years worth of uh, wearing down the knife um, on that one sharpening attempt. And uh, so you do uh, uh, you know, look for the best person um, for that job. Okay. Um, so in terms of, of where to buy knives, I'm going to leave that up to you, you know, the individual student and consumer uh, to figure out, you know, what's convenient for you and what makes sense for you. All right. Thank you. All right. Next question. If one did not finish um, any of their picture assignments, the photo upload assignments in professional cooking certification course, uh, how many extensions uh, do they need uh, to to get completely done with their their their, their certification? Uh, I mean, in terms of of uh, getting scored by your administration or our chef instructor team. Okay, so a an extension is thirty days, and um, you know within that thirty days. Uh, it's going to be up to you to submit assignments. Uh, and, you know, our turnaround is, you know, it's usually two, two or three days. Okay. Um, so it's conceivable that if you prepared all of your assignments, got all your photos ready, bought your, your extension, and then all at once uploaded all of your assignments and turned them in, um, that, uh, yeah, you know, let's say within a, I don't know, maybe within a week, you know, that we would have time to, to work through those. Um, if, uh, you bought your extension and then started cooking and doing your, um, photo upload assignments, it would depend upon your pace, um, for completing those assignments. So, you know, in the, um, pro cook course, there are like 30 or more than 30 assignments. And so there's quite a lot of work to do. Um, so it just depends on your approach. Okay. But it's, uh, possible, uh, to get all of that graded, you know, within one extension. All right. Thank you. All right. Next question. I signed on a few minutes late, so sorry if you covered this already, but what are your favorite one or two oils for high temperatures for stir fry and for roasting? Um, you know, generally speaking, um, any refined oil is fine. Um, you know, some oils like, um, you know, avocado oil are popular these days. And, um, you know, there are certainly others like canola oil. Um, but uh, uh, if you're if you have a particular concern beyond the smoke point, such as the nutrient profile of a of an oil, I'm going to let you do the reading on that. Okay, um, but uh, I mean, otherwise, in terms of oils that are effective, you know, at that uh, uh, those higher temperatures, most any refined oil, okay, is is going to be fine. Um, you know, keep in mind that you know, oil refinement varies, you know, that, that filtering process varies. And, you know, you can, you can even find, uh, you know, some olive oils that um, um, can be used for um, dry heat cooking 
although you might want to drop the, the temperature just a little bit, okay? But so there's some different ways to approach this question, all right? But uh, you know, give it a try and, and see uh, what might appeal to you. Thank you. All right, next question. Is there any restaurant or cafe management courses you recommend? Uh, I can start learning. Uh, it would really mean uh, make my appetite for learning fulfilled. Uh -huh. um, yeah, great question. Um, you know, we at present do uh, not offer a restaurant management course. Um, I'm aware of some, generally speaking, uh, through you know community colleges around the uh, around the U.S. Um, you know, that might offer a short course or a, a standalone class or two uh, that you might uh, in, uh, check out. Um, I don't know any specific programs, uh, you know, that, uh, that I can recommend, however, but I'm aware that they're out there. Some are online options and some are on ground options. So be sure to, uh, you know, understand uh, what those uh, courses entail. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, the last one um, is, uh, let's see, it's like a question or comment from Omar. So uh, on tagines, tagines are traditionally earthenware and won't work on induction unless the pot is made with a cast iron bottom. Uh, you can get similar results with a Dutch oven and parchment paper between the lid and pot. Okay, excellent. Um, some uh, wonderful insight from Omar. Thank you for sharing. All right. And um, this brings to conclusion uh, today's uh, open office hours. And I want to thank all of you for your participation today, uh, whether you submitted a question or were listening into the conversation. And I look forward to seeing you again uh, at uh, our next live event. And, uh, you know, until then, happy cooking. Thank you very much.